Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. An absolute pleasure to be able to speak to you today. How are you, all right? I'm good, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for talking to me. Um, a Mother's Fury, um, quite a watch. For people who don't know anything about it, can you kick off with a brief introduction? What can they expect? Sure. It's a thriller about a mom who's a regular American upstate New York mom, has four kids, and her son goes off to college, and she's kind of an annoying helicopter mom, as we call it. There's too much in her son's business, and he's rushing a fraternity. And in the fraternities in the United States, you have to learn all these, oh, um, oh, pledges and by heart he's not very good at that so she's constantly harassing him to make sure he gets into that fraternity and then when he gets in all hell breaks loose and there's a terrible hazing incident and her life takes a complete turn and she could you know fold up and and give it up forever or go on the war path for her son and that's what she does and I guess a lot of the stuff in here is very familiar. And, you know, even within British culture, we do have this thing. I know when I've been at Freshers Week going to university, this thing of drinking too much, but hazing specifically does feel like quite a unique American thing, a unique American university with the fraternities um, uh, type, you know, initiation um, right. kind of tradition. So what made you decide that this was going to be, you know, a fascinating topic to explore uh, in this film? Well, I have three kids. And at the time when I wrote it, they were, one was in high school, two were in college. And you kind of lay in bed at night and you hear all these stories and think, oh my God, I hope that's not going to be my kid. So it's kind of like my imagination running wild, you know, at the time that I wrote it and just, you know, you, you almost can't even go there to put yourself in the shoes of the mother or father who has to experience this senseless, ridiculous, you know, terrible um, hazing and the, and the results of it. And did you have any like personal connection to any of these sorts of stories or was it something you had to kind of go and research to actually understand? So obviously throughout the film also becomes apparent that these aren't just sort of one-offs. There's actually no. an issue with it, but it's not something maybe people talk about enough. And there's perhaps a sense of not wanting to um, kind of do away with these traditions. So a lot of people want these stories to kind of be su suppressed in some way. Right. Well, I live in outside of New York City in New Jersey now. And one of the biggest cases was in New Jersey with a boy named Tim Piazza, who was um, a couple towns over from me. So it was very close, you know, and some and, you know, these the kids go wild and, you know, so it's Russian roulette is what it is. It's like and it keeps happening, keeps happening. And the whole culture changed here with the colleges from when I was in college. It used to be beer. Kids would drink beer, kegs. And then they stupidly change the drinking age in the United States from 18 to 21. So it becomes like, you know, the, the forbidden fruit. So then kids would drink vodka and hard liquor that they could hide in water bottles. And the whole, everything changed because, you know, let's face it, no one even really knows what they're doing when they're drinking hard liquor half the time. You know what I mean? It's not the same deal. And when you're a kid just learning how to drink, and it's a different culture over here too. I mean, I know I've worked in Denmark a lot. I've worked in Europe where they you kind of introduce kids to alcohol with their parents or their grandparents here it's like taboo and it's like you've drank you're in trouble you're grounded you're not playing sports and so then when they go to college they kind of go hog wild it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, an avalanche basically and you've got such an incredible cast um you know particularly Robert Patrick as as your partner in the film but also kind of the younger cast and these aren't easy scenes to shoot and you know particularly not wanting to give anything away we'll get towards the latter end of the film as well um some really really tricky situations that these young actors have to be in so how did you uh you know how did you work with all these different cast members well interestingly um my, our director Vivica Musai who's from Denmark she and I have been friends for a long time she has kids so my you know I wrote the film my son was in college he's an actor my daughter's an actress come to find out and when they came, first of all, when they came home to my house, which is the fraternity house scenes are filmed in my house. So they came home and they looked at the, they looked at the living room and they're like, what in the hell is this? This looks ridiculous. This is, what is this? I said, oh, I decorated it for the, you know, I, I set decorated it, as they say, for the, for the um, frat. And they said, this doesn't look anything like one. You leave, go out to dinner. We'll, we'll, we'll make it look like it. And then my son literally got all his friends to play the frat boys. So they were, they, they were kids. A lot of them were kids that I had known growing up. So in between shots, I'd be like, guys, rock it. Like, this is, this is your chance. Like, no, a lot of these guys were not actors. They're authentic, you know, fraternity guys or tough guys. So it's like, go for it. This is your chance. I remember the morning, 
the morning of the um, big fraternity scene, like the initiation, I forgot to tell the extras to learn the pledge. And Vivica, you know, she's like, you don't know your pledge. This is ridiculous. I'm like, well, I never gave it to them. So I took them outside. I was like, guys, repeat after me. I believe the importance of virtue. I, they're like, I believe in the importance of virtue. I believe in it. So we were like a, like a, like a football team almost, you know what I mean? And, and, and then of course we had the girls come in and, you know, literally we handpicked every extra. I, I handpicked every extra down to even the senator scenes. So they were people that it was like a, project that everyone wanted to do well it was more like a play really and of course so so you wrote this you produced it and you starred in it um so it's obviously you know a kind of a passion project of yours did you ever consider directing it as well or would that have been one too many hats to be wearing and how was it kind of having to have those different um you know positions when you were making the film well I first of all I've done three Lars von Trier movies uh, you know, in Denmark and the way they do things in, in, in Europe are so much different than here in that it is more like a play. There's no really above the line and below the line. So you don't get online to go to lunch and say to the prop guy, excuse me, I'm an actress. It's we're all of the same effort and each cog in the wheel is equally as important. But producing was insane. So I would like shoot like maybe really dramatic scene or a, any scene. And then I'd be on the phone like to my husband, like, are the porta potties emptied? Okay, make sure the food is here. What time is it coming? And Vivica would be like, Siobhan Van Hogan, put the, put the phone down, stop producing. But I couldn't, you know what I mean? There was no way. But I, but also I think because of writing it, I had lived with it for so long that I was able to shift gears into the character when the time came. And I really trusted my whole team. Like all the actors, except for maybe two, I'd worked with before and loved. Robert Patrick and I have worked together for the past 35 years on at least five times. So as soon as I wrote it, I, I knew, I was like, the husband in the movie's a lot like my husband. I was like, who's like a tough, like American dad, kind of old fashioned, loves his kids, but he's a little rough around the edges. I was like, and Robert Patrick. I mean, Robert Patrick is not only a great actor, but he is a fabulous American. Like he, he, he goes out for the vets, he rides a Harley, he supports the American troops. He's like, you know, the, the exact guy that I wanted. Jake Weary, um, I had worked with him when he was 19 and I knew when I met him, I was like, this kid's a fabulous actor anyway. And then the crew. So I had worked with, with Matthias Schubert, the, um, cinematographer. And, you know, people would say to me, this looks like it's a, like a $7 million film. And I was like, <laughs> I wish, but anyway, um, I, I loved his work and I had worked with him on this, this horror film. And I wrote to him, I had his, I'm technically completely challenged just like in the movie. And I was like, Matthias well, I write his email and I put at AOL.com because I'm a dinosaur and that's what I have. And then I was, and he doesn't answer me back. And I was like, my God, that's so weird. I thought we got along really well. Huh. So then I was like, one day I was in the middle of the night, I was like, maybe it's Gmail. So I write to him and I was like, and he writes back. I was like, I wrote this film. I'd love you to be the cinematographer. And he's so talented and it looked amazing. And then the last two days of the film, we filmed all of it in my town in Rumson, New Jersey, but I'm from upstate New York, which is like five hours up. And I wanted the exterior shots to be up there because that looks like exactly the fall, what it looks like in American colleges in, in, those, in that season. So we're driving up to upstate to Syracuse and we were in Binghamton, New York, it's like an hour and a half way. And we're filming in the car. Like, like I'm driving the car, the camera's behind me. The, the mic is like down, tucked down below. And Vibica, we take a little break and the director says, we have an A-list film but we don't have an A-list editor. And I like, didn't even, I never even thought of post-production. I was like one step at a time, like one day at a time. So I was like, my God, I never even thought of that. So I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was like, let me think, 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 think. And I was like, wait, I know this fabulous editor, Sabine Emiliani from France, because I did this Johnny Depp film with Wayne Roberts, my friend. And I, was, and I never met her. She would call me because I played like a drunk in it. And she'd call me like, I can't believe you're so funny in this film. So I called her and I go, would you... I go, I wrote this film. She's like, well, when do you need it to start post? I go, next week. <laughs> she says, I can't. I have another film, but I'd love to read it. So she reads it, she, you know, with a time chat difference. She calls me this morning. She goes, I'm all in. She said, the other film is my husband's documentary. I'm going to push it off. So it was all these people. Like, it was completely like what goes around comes around and like pay it forward. Because, you know, I was always taught you treat people the way you want to be treated. And and it just all came together. It was kind of like that show, This Is Your Life. It was like, I just trusted everyone so much and they trusted me and it worked out. Matter of fact, we just finished another film 
called Shelter and Solitude that'll be out next year with the execs, Vivica directing, Sabine editing, Matias, Robert Patrick plays my my brother in this one. So now he's been my husband, brother. My friend said, well, if you keep aging this way from doing these movies, he could play your son in the next one. But anyway, that's what happened. And um, coming to your character specifically, I mean, how do you see her? And, you know, I like the fact that there's kind of a lot of comedy in, in her character. Yeah. And maybe you can tell she's the kind of person that may be a bit overlooked or, or underestimated. And then totally. she just, you know, you know, absolutely surprises everybody with her, her reaction, you know, when she could kind of collapse, go under, crumble. She absolutely right. kind of rises up. So, and also the thing of um, class in the film, because I think, you know, that comes out a lot, both comedy and in a very kind of like dark way. When you see like, she's going into these beautiful rich houses, the people who hold the power. Yes. Okay, so I think that this is a woman with four kids. She's overwhelmed enough with the kids and with the doing the right thing by the husband. She's worried about everybody. She never even aspires to being on what we call, I don't know if you're the same, the PTA, like the parents. She doesn't even, she doesn't even want to like, volunteer at school she's like I got enough to do at home with getting the lunches ready and just you know her her goal in life is to set example good example for a kid with her with their faith which you know which isn't even a good example she's swearing her head off saying her prayers and which funny Robert Patrick said to me Siobhan I always wanted to be in a faith-filled film but they're always so icky and like I love you and you know I'm from an Irish Catholic family we never said I love you <laughs> We never said I love you. We, we were like, that's weird. Like if, if my father did say I love you, like, huh, something must be up. Is he dying? Anyway, so now she lives this regular life, never wanted to be in the limelight, just was happy with her position in life, is intimidated by, um, you know, a different class of people, uh, quote unquote, higher class. Um, and she gets, when she realizes that her son has been completely wronged, her family has been shipwrecked she's like f this i'm going for it for my kid it's like her maternal instinct kicks in and she goes on a road trip it's probably the first time she's ever been alone in her life you know i am i imagine that she came from like a big family she goes right into marriage has these kids and you know there isn't a lot of downtime where you're alone and even have any time to think so now she's been depressed sitting on this couch she's think think thinking and she realizes wait a minute there's a whole system out there that's screwing my kid and my family. And I'm done. And, and her, and her, her maternal, not only her maternal, but her like maternal and basic, like female warrior instincts, you know, kick in. And so then when she's up against these people that she never really felt comfortable with, like Washingtonians, she's like, really? You know, they, they basically act like you don't act like this at a party. She's like, she doesn't know the rules. She's like, oh, not only do I not know the rules, but I don't care about the rules. So screw you and you screwed my son. And now you're not doing anything for me. Well, I'll do it myself. And, you know, ultimately it feels like there's a lot to unpick in this film. And I love the way it kind of jumps around the genre as well. Like <clears throat> yes. the beginning, we think maybe it could, you know, might be a more sort of earnest film perhaps about these sorts of issues. And it almost kind of goes into kind of a thriller. Um, and, you know, it deals with things like toxic masculinity and how that actually is something that can pass through, you know, any kind of class of family. And perhaps it's even worse, you know, in these very privileged families, you know, the father who doesn't seem to want to anything to change despite what's happened to his son. Um, so what do you think ultimately people take away from watching it? Do you want to kind of shine a light on, on some of these issues specifically? Well, actually, I think what's important about that is is Robert Patrick, Robert Patrick's character might appear as toxic masculinity, but when, when push comes to shove, he's as soft and loving, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like crosses all um, subjects. And you like, even the fraternities, like I'm not anti-fraternity, I'm anti-cruel bad guys, whether it's in a fraternity or, and women, whether it's in a fraternity or at the government level or in the family, like, don't be mean to your brother and sister, don't be mean to your fellow frat, a brother and don't be mean to do the right thing at the at the level at the government level so i think to take away is we have to start to be more kind to one another and we have to realize the dangers of following someone who's really not a good person and listen to your gut and then when you mix in drugs and alcohol and you're not listening to your drug your gut it just everything implodes and and all the final i guess would be don't ask, underestimate the power of a mother. You know what I mean? 
because you might seem like your lot in life is to raise children, set, set a good example and make lunches and get them raised, but push me far enough and I'll, and I'll, I'll be the, the general of the army. And of course, you know, I, I think I'm out of time, but you know, we, we've seen you on our screens for a long time, but you know, how does it feel to perhaps be taking even more agency over the kinds of roles you're doing, you know, going from the producing, the writing, and, and can you tell us what you're going to be doing next? Yes. So, well, it's funny. Over the years, I always did one person shows because, you know, I was always kind of known for comedy. And then luckily Lars von Trier helped, you know, get you got, get me out of being pegged. So I got to play serious roles with him. So I was able to cross the line. Thank God. So, but then like the mother, I have the three kids. And when, when my youngest daughter, Sinead, was a junior in high school, you know, by that time they could care less. They're like in the door, out the door, drop the bag, grab an apple, out the door. I'm like, my God, I'm like, what am I going to do? I mean, because normally as an, as an actress, you know, I'd work like maybe three months out of the year. Of course you lie. And people are like, what are you doing? You're like I'm working. And you know, like you act like you're working six months out of the year, but on the average, I'd say I was always working like maybe three to four months out of the year. So I was like, well, that's not going to cut it because I'm not domestic. And what the hell am I going to do now? So I was like, well, I've written enough one person shows and I like doing them, but it's not like, it's like really fun. Like, it's not like you go out afterwards and be like, wasn't that scene fun? Cause it's just yourself. So I was like, well, I've been in this business long enough. I should, maybe I can write a movie. And what you're saying about the genres is really interesting because people would say to me, you know, um, when the A story and then the B story and then the C story, it's like, what is, I don't even know what they're talking about. I was like, I just <laughs> wrote what I thought would, I just kept writing. Someone just said to me, just write, write, write. I had no idea about the technical. They're like, okay, so that's good. So at page, you know, 25, you're into the, you're into the B story. I'm like, I am? Oh, okay. So, so anyway, um, during editing of, of, um, rushed, I was literally lying in bed one night and COVID had hit. And I was like, this idea came to me and I was like, holy smokes, I better write this down. So I have a whole new movie that's, we're just finished editing or well, finished editing. Um, but we're doing the color grading now and it's called shelter and solitude. And as I said, Robert Patrick plays my brother, Dan Castellaneta, who's Homer Simpson. He plays a prison guard. And this great actor, Peter Macon, plays a prison guard. My son, you know, my son and my daughter are both in Rushed. My son plays like a bad boy brother. He's the best friend of Jake Weary. And my daughter <laughs> plays the sleazy girlfriend of Jake Weary in Rushed. So in my new movie, Shelter and Solitude, my son plays like this nerdy cop and my daughter plays like a hippie. She's like, mom, I really like that you've written so far for me, a sleaze and a hippie. What's going on? But anyway, so that movie will be out. And that's like about a wannabe country singer during COVID and it's a prison story. So it's, it's pretty cool. And um, so I wrote another movie and I'm, and that's come, you know, being added in and then I'm, I'm working on another movie now. Amazing. And, and do you see that things are changing a bit? Like the fact that women are taking more, being more in the driving seat, whether that's producing, writing and putting these female characters on the screen that we wouldn't normally have them as our central character kind of thing. 100%. You're so lucky at your age. And I tell my kids this too, like there would never be a female director when I was, when I was starting out ever. It just wouldn't happen. And um, you see it so much now. Um, and like in, on the cruise, you'll see women like, actually my youngest daughter right now, Sinead, the one that was telling about the actress, Monday night, Sunday night at 1030, I got a call from this guy who was the first uh, assistant cameraman on my other movie. He goes, Siobhan, I'm doing a film in New Jersey and we're really short, short in the art department. Do you know anybody? And I go, my daughter, she bartends on the weekends. She's you know got one more year left to college. So she's literally hauling, she goes, mom, I'm literally hauling the heaviest things, packing the truck. I go, good, that's good for you because it's great to know all ends of the business. So you always appreciate every part of it and see which cog of the wheel, it takes every cog to work. Anyway, the, the answer is yes, the business is so much better for everyone, diversity, um, women, and it's also so much more accessible because of what you can do with independent films. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, I mean, kids can pick up a phone and get into festivals and, you know, figure this out from the internet. Like in the old days, you'd be like, well, I don't know how to do this. And I don't know someone at the higher level. So how do I do it? Now you just Google who are the best, what are the best film festivals? How do I do it? How long should my film be? That kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's, 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 I think it's a great time for filmmakers and it's not, and there used to be a real, upper echelon like well if you're not in this forget it but now it's like you can just be grassroots and start mm, yeah 
It's amazing. Well, I've taken up yeah. too much of your time already, but it's been such a pleasure Not to see you. Not at all. Thank so you nice talking to you, Sarah. Enjoy Can't your wait for else to see your mother's fury. Yeah, it's very oh, warm. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Very Thank- Lovely to chat to you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Appreciate Bye. it. Bye-bye. Bye.